tradition that goes back 83 years to 1938. This lecture's topic is GO3M, Mountains Melting and Metamorphism, presented by Donna L. Whitney. More about Donna later. For tonight's format, we'll have these announcements, then Donna's one hour lecture, and that'll be followed by Q&A. All participants other than the hosts, the presenter and the moderators are muted. For most lectures, including this one, Randy Strobel is the host and he, Dave Wilhelm and I are moderators. As always, thanks Randy for setting up these Zoom webinars. The Zoom platform offers a number of means for interaction that we use. We would like to handle most questions at the end. To enter a question at any time during the lecture, click the Q&A icon and type in your question. You need not wait until the end. For those few persons joining by phone, we will unmute you at the end in case you have any questions. We might also unmute other questioners if they need to clarify their question. If you have a quick question for which you'd like an immediate answer, click the raise hand icon and enter the question. For these, the moderators will use their judgment about interrupting the presenter during the presentation. Also use raise hand to report any technical issue you might experience. There's also a chat option that allows you to type a message for all participants to see. Feel free to use that before the lecture starts to greet others. Be sure to use the all panelists and attendees option. I'll, I'll mention three other ways to use chat shortly. Many of these GSM webinars, including this one, are recorded and will be made available on YouTube. We will send members and other participants an email with the link when the recording becomes available. A full lecture schedule is on our website, gsmn.org. Thanks to Steve Erickson for arranging another outstanding slate of topics and presenters. Our next webinar is scheduled for April 26th, two weeks from tonight. The subject is how modern geochronology is transforming our understanding of geological rates. An example from Alaska. The speaker will be Cameron Davidson, PhD. He is the Charles L. Dennison Professor of Geology at Carleton College. This will be the last lecture this spring season. The lecture for May 10th will be rescheduled at a later date. As with our live lectures, this lecture is free and open to the public, not just GSM members. If you are not a GSM member, please open the chat box and type non-member in your city, state, province, or country. Also mention how, mention how you found out about us. We'd like to see how many non-members attend so we can see how well our information reaches the general public. So please do that courtesy for us. Thank you. Of course, we would love for you to consider joining our organization. Membership information and forms are available on our website. Membership dues are the primary method by which we fund these lectures and our other programs. Also, we can count the number of devices that tune in, but that, not the number of people watching from each. So, so we can get a better count of those participating if you are watching with at least one other person, type two persons or whatever the number is in the chat box. Thank you for that. Continuing education credits. These lectures are eligible for one hour of CE credits. If that's something you can use, use chat to request a form, include your name and email address. If you don't want everyone to see this information, there is a chat option that allows only the moderators to see what you type. Following the meeting, we will fill out a form, sign it, and email it to you. Are there any other announcements? Uh, use raise hand if you have one. Okay. Uh, tonight's speaker, Donna Whitney, is from Maine and graduated from Smith College where she discovered metamorphic petrology. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Her PhD is from the University of Washington. 
After four years as an assistant professor at UNC Chapel Hill, she was hired by the University of Minnesota in 1997, where, she, where she's been ever since. She has been the head of the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences since 2012. Active field sites when there isn't a pandemic going on are in the Western US, Central Australia, New Caledonia, France, Norway, and Turkey. Her husband is also a geology professor at UMN. So at this point, welcome Donna. Thank you. Go ahead and share my screen, I guess. I think you have to stop. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And thank you for the invitation. I always like to give a talk to this group. I'm anticipating a lot of really interesting questions. Uh, I definitely hope that if you have a, a question or something you want clarified during the talk, I'd be happy to, to clarify that as we go along. So I, I'm a metamorphic petrologist, and that means I study the rocks that have been transformed, uh, usually deep in the earth, but at various uh, levels of, of the crust, usually oceanic and continental crust. And I use the minerals, the composition, the structure to interpret tectonic processes uh, that have happened mostly long ago, but are relevant to understanding modern tectonic processes. And I particularly love studying mountains. And so I wanna talk a little bit, when you say mountain, uh, you know, you picture, you probably will picture a mountain, uh, a topographic mountain. And so in fact, uh, I'd like to know what your favorite mountain is, if you have one or mountain range. Um, but my only rule is you cannot pick a volcano. Uh, we're talking about mountains that form during tectonic convergence and I don't get too worried about the technical definition of a mountain, like Mount Agamenticus here near my home in Maine is probably not technically a mountain, it's more like a hill, but you know, it, it's topographically high compared to the region around it. So I'd be interested just to see if you wanna put in the chat, um, if anyone has a favorite mountain or, or mountain range. Doesn't have to be the highest peak. Oh, yes, the Panamints are great. great. If you have an obscure mountain that you love, you can ex maybe say where it is, but, um, oh yes, Oak Mountain, Medicine Bows. Yes, the whole Blue Ridge, I love the Blue Ridge. These are great. Um, ooh, I don't know where that one is. Where is Mount Tampano, Ogos? Yes, the Ozarks count, absolutely. <laughs> Mount Whitney. Good one. Wind rivers, yeah, wow. I mean, it's exciting to think about these mountains, right? They're so spectacular. Um, you know, maybe you've climbed them or just admired their views, but you know, there's just so much that goes into forming mountains. And the way that I like to think about mountains is, is what went on uh, deep in the crust to form them. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that because you know, when we think about mountains, you know, we think about their shape and, and how high they are or, you know, how hard they are to, to hike up or climb. Uh, and as topographic features, they're carved by, you know, glaciers, you know, water, various sorts, rock falls, other forms of landslide that, you know, that's what gives us these distinctive peaks in many cases. But of course, mountains as, as mountain ranges or mountain systems, are formed by tectonic processes. And so, you know, where plates um, converge. And so if we look from space at where there's high topography, we can see, uh, you know, mountain ranges, for example, you know, one extending all the way from, from the Alps through Central Asia, through the Himalayas, that's one big mountain range. Uh, we can see older mountain ranges like the Appalachians, uh, you know, just be beautiful, beautiful features. Uh, and so, yes, surface processes are extremely important in, in carving the surface, but this is working on crust that has been thickened by the plate convergence. And so that, that creation of really thick, you know, continental crust that's deformed and heated and, and metamorphosed is what 
sets the stage for what can happen in, in a mountain range and, and basically how continents evolve through time, compositionally and, and mechanically. And so, you know, obviously when you, when you talk about mountains, one of the first things that, you know, you think about or, or ask someone is, well, how, how high is it? Uh, but that, that's actually not, for me, that's not the interesting question. Uh, it's interesting if I'm about to climb there, I want to know that, <laughs> uh, or especially what the relief is relative to where you start uh, climbing. But what I find really interesting is why are some mountain ranges very wide and some are very narrow? And you know, if you think about it, I, I'm sure you all know a bit about the Appalachians, right? They're the product of major collisions throughout the Paleozoic, you know, with continents and island arcs, and, and yet they're, they're rather narrow. You know, the, the Ural Mountains are, are similarly a narrow mountain range in, in Russia. But then we have, you know, the, the Himalayan Tibet system, which extends for more than a thousand kilometers from the site of the collision. And, and there are others that are harder to see in the topography that, that are very wide mountain ranges. So what's, what's going on to create uh, wide mountain ranges? And, and as you, you know, can see actually, because we know where the high mountains are, that uh, wide mountain ranges are also associated with some of the highest mountains. So let's look at a cross section of the Himalayas. This is uh, going from south to north. So India is coming in from the left and it's uh, under thrust uh, below uh, the Asian plate going off to the north here. And we see a whole series of, of faults and different packages of rocks. But look here, here's little Mount Everest, right? This, <laughs> this little peak right here uh, in the scale of the whole crust it is rather a small feature. Take nothing away from the, you know, the people who, who climb it, you know, great peril. Uh, but if we think about the whole crust, there's just really a lot going on below the surface that's really important to the development of the mountain range as a whole. And one of the things I'm going to focus on in this talk that my research group works on is this uh, regions of partially molten crust. Uh, so I'll talk about that more. I'll show you what I mean. What do the rocks look like? But um, you know, if you think of, of magma, that, that's, you know, a melted rock. And then if you think of a metamorphic rock, that's actually, by definition, a, a solid rock without magma. And so when I talk about partially molten crust, it's really a mixture of those two. It, it's metamorphic rocks that got hot and they started to melt. So there's a little bit of magma in them, maybe 10, 20 percent, but it's not a magma, like a, a granite. It's, it's, it's hot crust, it's flowing crust, and it's got some melt in it, which helps it flow. Uh, but it's really, um, yeah, don't, don't think about a, a big magma body like a granite or anything like that. So what, this, what is this stuff? What is this partially molten crust? And, and how does it help us understand mountains? What's going on underneath these mountains? You know, and so I wanna look more closely at some of these regions. The, this is of course projected below the surface. Um, so how do we know there's partially molten crust down there? It, it comes from geophysics, geophysical data where we can infer what the properties are of, of material at depth. Uh, but we can also look in the geologic record for these systems once we get to see the deeper levels. And from that, we've drawn this cartoon uh, for a convergent system, much like the Himalayas, for what it might have looked like uh, when it was, you know, it had thickened and it was really just starting to get hot. Uh, we see regions uh, of older mountain belts that are sort of Himalaya-like, but we get to see deep in them where there's really vast regions uh, of partially molten crust uh, that we see once it's crystallized. And we see that it, it has fragments of unmelted rocks in it and that this has flowed. It's flowed laterally and it's also flowed vertically. And it's this vertical flow and uh, as it connects to this lateral flow that we're really interested in because the lateral flow is what's making the wide mountain belts. And it's the vertical flow that in some cases makes uh, some pretty impressive uh, peaks. You can see it's, this is a cartoon, but it's drawn to show some sort of higher regions here because this, this crust, when it comes up and is exposed, it, it's resistant to weathering and, and you can get some high regions around it. Now, something that can be a little tricky to understand is that you know, this, the overall tectonics 
of these regions is convergence. There, there are plates colliding and we're seeing the products of that collision, the thick, hot crust and the start of partial melt. But the reason that we have this vertical flow, and I'll develop this idea more throughout the talk, is we have these very local regions of extension where because the crust is thick and hot and weak, it can start to collapse locally. It can kind of start to pull apart. And, and that draws the deep, hot crust up from below. Again, I'll explain that more uh, later, but this is absolutely key to understanding these systems that we have all sorts of uh, flow, lateral, vertical, and, and some fairly complex tectonics in terms of not just convergence, but also extension. But if we look at these regions where this partial molten crust has come up to the surface, you know, we see many places that look like that uh, around the world and including some uh, North American peaks. This is uh, in the Thorodon area of the Monashi Mountains in British Columbia is a beautiful example of that. And also the Pioneer Mountains in Idaho, where one of my graduate students is working. So these are places where partially molten crust in a region of convergence has come up in a local zone of extension and come up quite close to the surface and eventually been formed um, as mountain peaks by glaciers and other surface processes. Okay, so a little bit of vocabulary. I'm gonna use these two rock names throughout the talk. And when I'm talking about partially molten crust, uh, once it's crystallized and we can see it in the geologic record, it looks like this rock, this outcrop on the left. So this is what I was talking about, how there is a little bit of melt, the lighter colored areas are, are basically granites. And then it's mixed in with this darker material, which is the metamorphic rock. And so this is all mixed together and you can see the fold deformed. Uh, and so this is migmatite. Migmatite is crystallized partially molten crust. It's got a lot of quartz and feldspars and, and some other um, you know, micas or amphiboles to make the darker parts. And then we have this rock called eclogite, which is just an absolutely beautiful rock with lots of garnets and this green pyroxene. And it's a very dense rock, right? These are very um, dense anhydrous minerals. Uh, so it's a very different rock than migmatite. And what you can see here is that eclogites are high pressure and high temperature rocks. They form from basalts at, that are metamorphosed under high pressures and high temperatures. And migmatites, when we figure out their pressure temperature conditions where they crystallize are typically low pressure rocks. They're both high temperature rocks as you might expect from the, the melting of, of the migmatites, but, but migmatites fairly low to medium pressures. Well, that's interesting because they occur together in many cases. And so what does it mean if you have an eclogite, a high pressure, high temperature rock in a low pressure rock, how, how did it get there? Well, remember, this are, these are not magmas. So you, you don't just rip off you know, xenoliths, if you know that term, uh, from magma systems. That These had to have had a history together, but only the, only the eclogite records the high pressure and not the migmatite. So this has puzzled geologists for, for a very long time of seeing these juxtapositions. And it's really only recently with some of the modern tools of, of petrology and geochronology and structural geology that we've been able to really understand why these rocks are occurring together. And I'll at least tell you what my hypothesis is and how we've tested it. So we think that the eclogite is recording the deep crust of mountain systems during metamorphism and also some aspects of these crustal flow systems that create the wide mountains and also locally brings up deep crust to, to form mountain peaks. Uh, and that the migmatite was there too. It was right down there in the deep crust with the eclogite, but the minerals don't record that. They, they've been overprinted. You know, the melt has helped it lose its memory. The, the minerals, the quartz and the feldspar don't tend to give any pressure information. We think that these rocks were together. This was like those fragments you saw in the cartoon of the partially molten system. Um, but the, the migmatites have just lost their memory of that part of the history. And the eclogites, based on their minerals, um, have kept that memory. Well, that's a hypothesis. We have to do some work to, to try to test that. 
So we need to go around the world and find some magmatites, ideally with eclogites in them or other high pressure uh, rocks that may record this, this deep history, which the magmatites we think have forgotten. And magmatites form or are found in the geologic record in many places around the world in origins of mountain systems of all ages, Archean to including this one in Papua New Guinea, which is popping out of the sea today. The metamorphic rocks are extraordinarily young. So billions of years of earth history, the earth has been forming magmatites. It's been flowing around. And when it comes to the surface, I like to go and study it. So we noticed, uh, my colleague Christian Tessier and I, with some of our students over the years, that in many cases in the world, when you are looking at a magmatite complex, it's in a, a structural dome. It's in a domal structure. And we don't think that that's a coincidence. We think that the, the formation of the dome is, is part of this crustal flow story. So we, we went around looking at domes of the world and we developed a, a kind of a related hypothesis to our, our ideas about crustal flow. So we, we were looking at the Montenoir Dome in the French Massif Central in particular, and we realized it was part of a whole series of domes in the Massif Central. And so we wondered, what if those are connected at depth? What if there was a deep crustal flow system and that each dome is just the tip of the iceberg of a much you know, vaster system below? And how would we test that? How would we figure out if there were, uh, was a connection uh, between those domes? So that, that's another idea I'm gonna develop as I go along in this talk. Okay, so this is kind of similar to the, the last picture, but with a few more arrows and other things dr uh, drawn on it. Uh, but this basically shows a tip of the iceberg idea of a dome shown in 2D with the crustal flow system here. And, and what, what we wanted to know about these systems was, well, how far can the crust flow uh, when it's in the deep crust? Can it go for hundreds of kilometers, tens, thousands? You know, some people had proposed that in fact, the Tibetan plateau formed by very large scale flow of the deep crust. Is that possible? Uh, or is it more local flow? Well, how fast does it flow? Is it going along at, you know, tectonic rates? Is it just sort of going really slowly so it can't go very far? Uh, how, how long do these systems last? And we also noticed fairly early on in our studies of these systems that when we looked at what was going on in the shallow crust, the faults and the basins and even some volcanic rocks, we saw that they were the same age as these formerly deep rocks. So we started uh, determining that these systems were linked uh, te tectonically. And then what, you know, the sort of the so what question is, who cares about domes? They're, they're really interesting structures, but is there any implications for continental evolution? So I, I hope to just briefly touch on some of those questions that we've been working on for, for years now. Our approach to studying domes and dome systems and figuring out from them how uh, wide mountain belts form is to use both fields-based studies, looking at the domes of the world and also numerical models. And I'll show you some of both. So here, this is actually one of our early models and we have some more sophisticated models. Uh, I'll show you also some of those, but I like to start with this because it, it's pretty um, visually easy to see what's going on, just to get your eye keyed into some of the processes. So th this is a cross section through thickened crust, 60 kilometer thick crust is a, is a good mountain belt. It's, it's not as thick as the Himalayas, which can get up to 75 kilometers, but it's twice as thick as a uh, normal sort of old uh, craton crust, for example. So it's, it's a good mountain belt thickness. And then we basically just pull on it. We pull on the, the crust and the upper mantle. And we put in these little passive markers so that we can uh, monitor the flow. They just sort of sit there and, and float around with the crust. And you can see, you'll be able to monitor the time in millions of years here. So here it goes, we're pulling on the crust and you can see the flow, the passive markers outline the flow. And as we pull on the crust or the lithosphere really, we see flow in the deep crust going on both sides converging in this central zone and going straight up, straight up, very close to the Earth's surface. 
and forming. It's 2D, so I have to call it a, basically a fold, but um, in 3D, that would be a dome. Okay. And this is partially molten crust. All this green material here is, is partially molten crust. It would be a migmatite if we could see it crystallized. And we started calling these structures double domes because yes, it is one big dome, but we see this steep fault right in the middle. And then these kind of subdomes on either side, these regions where, you know, crust flowing from one side will go up and then turn over and flow off to that same side. And the same will happen on the other side. So migmatite double domes, we think are, are signals of this crustal flow process. And we see them, we see double domes in nature. Here's a beautiful one in the middle of Australia, not too far from Alice Springs. We can see the Entia dome in a Google Earth image here. This is a migmatite dome. All of these sort of orangish hills are, are migmatite. And then right in the middle, before, before I put a label on it, I'll just point it out with the cursor. Here's the steep fault right in the middle. And then what kind of looks like different lobes of a brain. Those are the migmatite subdomes on either side. So it's a really perfect uh, sub, uh, migmatite double dome. Here's one, and this is actually the first one that we recognize on the island of Naxos in the Aegean Sea. There's a beautiful migmatite dome, forms the highest peaks, including uh, Mount Zeus on Naxos. And right in between, there's a steep fault, high strain zone with a subdome on either side. Here's one in the Pyrenees, beautiful migmatite double dome. And we've also worked on the Mont Noir dome. All, these three that I've shown here are all migmatite double domes with that steep zone in the middle and then the subdomes on either side. So we were working on these with our students and, and wondering, well, you know, how, how common are they in nature? We, we have several of them here. Uh, do they typically form or are they kind of unusual? Uh, under what conditions? What does it take to form a double dome, right? Is it basically strange, unusual conditions or are they fairly common? And, you know, that's where the modeling can come in because you can test all sorts of parameters with a model that uh, would be uh, difficult to do in nature. And so with our colleague Patrice Ray at the University of Sydney in Australia, uh, we just started systematically modifying, you know, our models. So looking at cooler crust and hotter crust, and thinner crust and thicker crust. And we can see that uh, there are certain models in which these double domes form and, and other models where they do not. And so from this, we know that you, you need normal to hot crust, not cool crust, and you need thick crust like you get in convergent zones of mountain systems. So th these are very uh, normal uh, conditions for, for mountain belts and collision zones typical temperatures, typical crustal thickness. I don't wanna overwhelm you, but we have so many models. <laughs> you know, we put a PhD student on this and she did an amazing job, again, uh, looking at different crustal thickness, looking at um, different properties of the deep crust, um, varying the rate at which we pulled on the model. So extension rate, and also adding um, sediments, having uh, sedimentation, surface processes occurring. And, and from that, we determine again, under what conditions do you get double domes? And there's some where you do not and others where you do. And so we could see that there's certain properties of partially molten deep crust that will give you a double dome. But if you have cooler, thinner crust, you will, you will not get one. And this, oh, I just wanted to show you some of our more recent models. This is what I was talking about looking at the importance of surface processes, like putting sediment into a basin. And so we see that it does affect the shape of the dome, but it doesn't affect whether you get a double dome or not. All of these, all of these models have this steep zone in the middle and then the subdomes on either side, whether they're, they're sediment or not. The, the only time it, it really starts to affect would be if you basically erupted really dense volcanic material into a basin. Um, and then you can get some really interesting different dynamics, which may have happened in the mid-continent rift here in near Minnesota, on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border actually a billion years ago. Okay, so here's where we are so far. We, we know 
from looking around the world that migmatite double domes are pretty common in nature. Um, it's easy to form them, we think, based on our modeling study with what I call reasonable parameters, meaning geologically reasonable parameters for uh, whatever you want to look at in terms of crustal properties or tectonic rates. And so I've just written some of them down here. So we think this is a first order process in, in mountain uh, systems. Well, how much steep crust is exposed by this mechanism? Is it just a little pinprick here and there on the map? Or again, is this a way that the deep crust can, can come up to the surface uh, as mountain systems uh, develop? This is, maybe it looks a little complex, but I wanted to put it in there because this is absolutely one of my favorite uh, results of this recent work. And so if you bear with me, this, this is basically a screenshot from one of the models after 10 million years of extension has occurred. So we formed a double dome. That this red region is a partially molten dome. And I, with white lines, I highlighted just the flow paths. And then after 10 million years, we, we just put a bunch of, of circles, uh, one across a, a traverse very near the Earth's surface, not at or near, and one a little bit deeper. Let's say uh, you were walking along uh, on the surface collecting rocks uh, across this dome, which doesn't actually, if you look at the, the lines, it, you wouldn't really necessarily know it was a dome at the Earth's surface after 10 million years. And then let's say it eroded a little bit deeper and we could also collect uh, some of these deeper rocks. We wanted to know if we, if we collect these rocks, where did they come from? How, how deep were they at zero million years when we started the model? This is it after 10 million years, where were they at the beginning? And the answer is almost all of them were at the, at the deep crust, the very you know, highest pressure part of the crust with the exception of the rocks that started out um, near, uh, near this normal fault that's in the middle of the model. They just uh, move out with the fault, they stay close to it. But all these other rocks all the way across this model were in the deep crust. And now they're at the surface in only 10 million years, which geologically is really fast. So we're basically overturning the crust. We're taking the deep crust and we're putting it at or near the Earth's surface, an incredibly short amount of time geologically. These were hot, partially molten rocks, and now they're at, at or near the surface. That, that kind of blew me away, but it, it matches what we see in nature, what we were starting to see in nature. And recognizing that these rocks were in the deep crust, when you pull on the models, they flow to the, towards the center, they go up this narrow channel, and then they move out into this sort of uh, mushroom shape on either side. They've gone on quite a journey. Right? They've traveled in some cases for you know, hundreds of kilometers overall. If you factor in the, the lateral flow and then the vertical flow and then more lateral flow, that they've really moved fast and a long distance in some cases uh, in a short amount of time. So we can model the pressure temperature path. This just shows uh, that they start deep and they go to shallow, um, staying at high temperature because they're moving so fast. And then once they get up here in the shallow crust, then they cool, they cool really rapidly. And so this matches what we see in nature. We can put the model paths over the paths that we extract from the rocks and they match really well. We can infer information by identifying the minerals and looking at the textures. And we see very good correspondence of the of the 2D models and nature. And so, so far the 2D models support the hypothesis that all these rocks came from the deep crust, even though some of them don't record it. The migmatites have no memory of this exciting part of their history, but we're lucky that there are some fragments that do record it. And so we can um, hypothesize about that the whole system of rocks uh, experience the deep crustal flow, whether or not they record it. So this is where people always say, but you know, you spent all this time on 2D models, but domes are 3D structures, the world is three-dimensional. Uh, what about 3D? 3D models are computationally more difficult to do, uh, but we do have some. Uh, we have taken 
3D blocks of rocks and model space and, and pulled on them. And we actually get fairly similar results. Um, and to first order, the, the rapid rate, the flow paths, the, the domal structure is all similar, except in 3D, of course, we can see that the, you know, what looks like just a fold in 2D is an elongate um, sort of whale shaped structure uh, coming in and out of, of the plane. So there's lots of interesting things we, we can do with 3D models as well, including looking at, at surface features. Okay, so what about nature? Let's go back, let's, let's go back and uh, think about what the rocks actually show. And to do this, I'll talk mostly about our field area in the Mont Noir, uh, which is in the southern part of the French Massif Central. Uh, there are a number of similarly aged bodies all the way from uh, Iberia to of, over to uh, the Bohemian Massif in Central Europe. So this is from the Variscan origin, which uh, was a Paleozoic origin mountain system. Well, the Mont Noir is one of my favorite domes. It's, it's a perfect double dome. There's a, a steep zone right down the middle and then two sub domes. And it also has eclogite. It was not easy to find the eclogite, I have to say. I'm not complaining about doing fieldwork in Southern France. I'm not gonna do that. Um, but some maps had it in the wrong place and uh, the land had changed a lot. There were forests where there used to be fields and it actually took us years uh, to find these, but it was well worth it when we eventually did. It was extremely exciting uh, to find this second one, especially. And uh, we've been working on them intensively since then. And what's extremely exciting to me anyway about these eclogites is you see that one of them is right in the core of the dome. It's right in that steep zone. Uh, and the other is at the margin of the dome. And that's just perfect because if we wanna test our ideas developed from models about double domes, then that's just exactly what we want. We've got one eclogite that came from the deep crust and came right up this channel and stopped and another one that ended up off to the side at, at the boundary between the partially molten crust and the overlying uh, schists, lower grade metamorphic rocks. So let's look at these two eclogites and see what they can tell us about the crustal flow system. So we've been working uh, for a number of years uh, with our students uh, on these two eclogites. So we've done lots of work on these rocks. Um, we've figured out um, all the sorts of things about their composition and their pressure temperature conditions when they were in the deep crust and the path they followed to get to the surface, how they were deformed, you know, other textural features, uh, the age of the crystallization of, of the rock that uh, they started off as. They started off probably as gabbro intrusions in the crust and the age of high pressure metamorphism. And so if we compare the two eclogites, the dome core and the dome margin eclogite, the rock and mineral, they have the same minerals. They both have garnet and they both have pyroxene. They're, they're perfect eclogites. But if we look at their composition, the chemical composition of the rock or of the, comparing the composition of the garnet or the pyroxene, they're different. If we compare their pressure temperature conditions, they are both eclogites, so, uh, but within the eclogite, uh, conditions, they're different. We compare their deformation um, structures, the orientation of the pyroxene, for example, the size of the garnets, they're different. If we look at the age of crystallization of the, the parent rock to the metamorphic rock by dating the cores of zircons, they're different. The only thing that's the same is the age of the high pressure metamorphism. So these rocks became eclogites at the same time and the age of the eclogites is the same as the age of the host migmatites. So the high pressure rocks are the same age as the low pressure rocks, supporting our hypothesis that they had a history together. But what do we do about all these differences? Well, it's actually fasc it's fascinating that they're different because that allows us to reconstruct that they came from different parts of the crustal flow system. That gives us a huge amount of information. So here's, here's our model. This is currently in review. Uh, my student Clem Hamlin is the first author of this interesting paper, uh, which has lots of analytical data, 
uh, uranium lead geochronology of zircons. It's got uh, mineral composition data. It's got um, uh, oxygen isotope data. It's really a rich, rich data set. And what she proposes, which I think is uh, very believable personally, is that the eclogite that ended up in the core of the dome came from a long way away. It has features that are similar to rocks far to the north in the French Massif Central. And so we think it came from, from the north and it flowed in the deep cross to, to quite you know, near the Moho, near the cross mantle boundary. And then it came up the steep zone where it stopped in the core when the system uh, came to a halt when it crystallized. But the eclogite that's at the dome margin now didn't come from very far. It came from very far vertically. It came from the deep crust, but it hasn't traveled laterally very far at all. It's, it's came just came straight up and moved a little bit out to the side, but that's it. It's got features more similar with this local sourcing. And then this is the first study of its kind to be able to, to show that, to be able to reconstruct the deep crustal flow system and to propose um, this long distance travel and to distinguish long distance travel from, from shorter travel uh, from formerly deep rocks. So we think the dome core rocks may have traveled hundreds of kilometers in the deep crust, um, maybe, certainly a hundred kilometers, we think more, and that the dome margin eclogite um, really didn't travel laterally very far at all before it ascended uh, in the dome system. So how do we test our tip of the iceberg hypothesis, right? We've worked a lot on these two eclogites in the Montenoir. If we want to uh, understand if this dome is connected at depth to this dome and this dome and this dome and this giant one here, we need to look at these other eclogites as well. And in fact, if they hadn't had a pandemic, I would have been in France last summer collecting these other eclogites and analyzing them to see if that supported the hypothesis or not. And so I'm not sure when I'll get there, but that's what we're going to do next um, to, to um, understand this crustal flow system. Uh, we may find that we're wrong and that every dome is just its own chemical system. But given the fact that one of these eclogites seems to have come from quite far north, we, we think there is some evidence that there is a lot of crustal flow. Okay, so these are some new findings. This has changed how we viewed uh, crustal flow in these mountain systems. And, you know, it, kind of classic way to look at, at how mountain systems develop is you have the plate convergence, the continents collide, and then sometime later there's, you know, erosion and you get mountain peaks. And we're saying, well, I, you know, there's something in between those two that's really important for uh, for continental evolution and, and for how mountain ranges develop. And it has to do with this local extension that can happen in thick crust that draws the partially molten crust up um, very fast over great distances, laterally and vertically, um, bringing them to the shallow crust where they crystallize rapidly. So even though these migmatites, if you look at them, look at their minerals, try to figure out their pressure and temperature, they look like low pressure rocks but their connection to eclogites, the similarity and timing, and, and these clues that we also get from models suggest that these flowed together and all of it was deeply sourced, even if only the eclogites record that. So potential significance. One, it was a surprise to us that so much of the crust that we were seeing at shallow levels had come from near the crust mantle boundary and tra traverse the whole thickness of the crust in, in a geologically short period of time, carrying their high temperatures with them and then, and then crystallizing rapidly. That, that was really interesting. But we started thinking more, you know, in terms of continental evolution as a whole, the fact that the, these deep hot rocks are coming up to the surface and crystallizing is kind of stabilizing the continents in a way, right? It's, it's, it's bringing deep rocks up that otherwise, if they stayed at depth, might have just stayed as dense eclogites and eventually even dropped away uh, you know, into the mantle. But this brings them up and, and basically uh, preserves the continents from being recycled into the mantle uh, by these um, convergent processes uh, o over long spans of time. So domes maybe kind of save the continents in a way. That's one kind of extreme way to look at it. But I think has a, a grain of truth to it.
so that that's what I wanted to tell you about. Thank you very much for listening. Well, Donna, thank you for a fascinating and stimulating discussion. Uh, appreciate it. Let's see what we have for questions. Uh, there's a question about domes in Minnesota. Uh, Don, I've got one question for you, Steve here. Yeah. Um, how is it that the, the magma types don't get uh, eaten, so to speak, in the recycling effort there, the low pressure or their, their, the mineral, mineralogy is, is such of, a, of the uh, low pressure and low temperature stuff. Um, would they not be exposed to higher pressures and temperatures and not be recycled or, or what's, what's happening there? Well, I think if I understand your question, they, I mean, they start deep and then they come up really rapidly to shallow levels and then they cool really quickly and that preserves them there. Okay. That, and that locks in the, the last conditions that they experience, right? Which is at low pressure. Okay. If that makes sense. Okay, uh, Donna, taking this first one from Diane Lynch, uh, on the side, on the slide describing magmatite domes uh, included a map and it looked as though at least one dome is in Minnesota. Can you tell us more about that dome? Yeah, well, that's a very old one, of course, like most rocks in Minnesota, metamorphic rocks anyway. Um, yeah, it's from the Pinocchian origin. There, there's a series of domes in in the Proterozoic and Archean rocks uh, across the Midwest. There's domes also in Wisconsin and, and Michigan and all across the Canadian Shield. Uh, there's, there's beautiful domes. Okay. Uh, let's see, from Doug Plunkett, where do the extension forces come from and when, and when we're generally talking convergence? Yeah, yeah. There's various... Um, ways that you can get extension. One is, is simply the thick, hot crust, which is weak at depth, can just start to collapse under its own weight. It's kind of a gravitational collapse. Uh, but there are also other ways that, depending on the relative plate velocities, sometimes even though the plates are converging <laughs> just from the relative velocities, you can have kind of a pulling away, uh, a kind of a pulling force in one of the plates. And, and so you can get extension during convergence. It's sort of counterintuitive, but it, it definitely happens. You get normal faults in the upper crust. Mm -hmm. Let's see, another one from uh, Carol Kay. Is the deep crustal flow propelled by a subducted ocean ridge or a subducted hotspot? Uh, um, most cases, no. You don't, you don't need any extreme heat. Uh, to do this, it's just normal crust, thick crust will start to melt for most rock compositions. That's actually mm -hmm. that, um, that's an interesting point though, because, you know, because you're bringing these deep hot rocks up to shallow levels and they still, you can tell that they were hot, right? They're, they're, they're magmatites and yet they record low pressures. And so uh, geologists were like, well, how do we get such hot rocks at such shallow levels? We had to have some extreme heating event going on at shallow levels. Like, we, yeah, we broke off the plate or we subducted a ridge or brought in some magma, but, but you don't need any of that. <laughs> you just need to bring the deep hot rocks up fast enough and you end up with low pressure, high temperature rocks. So that's kind of an interesting qu question. Uh, okay, the next one is from Hugh. Does the ascending crustal flow ever break through to the surface? If not, why not? And what is the closest the crustal flow can come to the surface? Ah, excellent, yes. Uh, well, the closest that we've seen it is uh, two kilometers from the surface. And we've determined that through various, uh, what we call thermochronometers, minerals that record different uh, temperature time histories. Uh, it probably doesn't break through the surface just because it's, um, it, it's too viscous by the time it's that shallow. And uh, so it's going to crystallize and basically stop ascending. But, but it can get really close. 
Yeah. That was a surprise in our research too. Uh, and here's one from uh, Lisa Peters. Why do the magnetites forget their pressure history? Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, I think the melt has part, part of the answer to that, that, you know, it's just kind of, even though it's a very fast process, um, any high pressure minerals have, have sort of reacted away um, because of the melt and the fluids that are there. Uh, whereas the eclogite's really kind of this dense, you know, this dense rock that's slower to react once it's um, no longer in the deep crust. But even there, you know, we were really lucky to find these eclogites because most of the rocks of that composition in the dome record the same compositions as the magmatite, the low pressures and the high temperatures. You know, 99.9% .9 of the rocks have, have reacted away uh, to these lower pressures. And there's these two little rocks uh, that still we were fortunate to see the high pressure history. Almost all of it's erased because of the melt. And from Barbara Heidemann, is there a similar mechanism in play with the basin range formation? Yeah, definitely. Um, we see domes um, in that area. Uh, you may be familiar that there's a whole belt of core complexes, uh, extensional features that go from you know, Mexico to British Columbia. It's interesting though, the ones in the, the north, well, I'd say central to north in that extensional province are like what I described. They, they brought up the deep crust, but the ones in Arizona and California, um, they did, they're more like those uh, models I showed that had you know, thinner or colder crust or stronger crust. They form these you know, sort of domal features, but not these uh, bring up the deep crust kind of uh, melty features that we've, we've talked about. So it really matters what the composition of the crust was and the thickness and the temperature uh, to how it's going to respond to that extension that, that affected so much of the Western US in the Cenozoic. Okay. And here's one from anonymous attendee. It's the difference between a dome and a volcano. Uh, well, volcanoes form from you know, entirely magmatic processes. Um, you can have a, a volcanic dome, right? A dome is just a structure. It's just a shape you know, with the sort of going out on all sides radially from the center. Um, but vol yeah, volcanic domes form entirely from magmatic uh, processes. Let's see, uh, we've got a few chat questions, I think, here. Um, I think the chat questions are taken care of, uh, Joe. Uh, they put them over in the in the Q and A. Okay. Unless okay. you see some. No. Um, well, that may be all we have. Uh, there is one um, call in person, and I've allowed her to. Uh, oh, maybe she went away. He or she. I did a lot of talk, but uh, then it disappeared. So, oh, these are all great questions. I really enjoy. Well, let's let's maybe just raise the issue. Uh, does anyone ha else have a question? We'll give a few seconds here. Okay. Um, Donna, we certainly thank you for a, a wonderful discussion. Uh, that was a, a depth to which I uh, hadn't really expected. That was great. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation again. Uh, I'll just interject. And, we had uh, 77 devices tuned in, which is probably about 90 people. So pretty good audience. Great. Great. Well, I thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you all in... Uh, in, in two weeks for our final presentation of the year. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, we'll see you later. Good night. Good night.